Hello, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Ursula. I'm an indie author of historical fiction. Today I'd like to be discussing the fifth book I had published, An Alexei Lived, An Alternative History. It's um, about the rule of Tsar Alexei II, the um, hemophiliac son of Nicholas II, and I obviously um, used um, real photographs for the um, front, the back, and the spine. I like worked you know, very hard to select just the right um, photographs for that. The uh, front cover is um, Alexander Palace in Sarskoye Selo, which was um, the last imperial family's um, main um, residence. By um, palace standards, it's fairly humble, but of course, it's you know still a palace, so it's pretty huge. The one on the spine is um, Alexei and several of his friends at the lower dacha of Peterhof, which is also one of their um, summer palaces. They were being um, pulled on the wagon by one of Alexei's um, sailor nannies, Clemente Nagorny, and the one on the back. I'm not quite sure who the um, girl sitting with him is. I, some people think it might be his um, cousin, um, Princess Olga of Greece and Denmark, and I think that's um, his sister Anastasia um, bending over by the rocks. Now, I began this book originally in, um, sometime in 1997 for my um, creative writing club for the um, final project we were doing. It had its um, Genesis in a play I began writing in December 95, but I'll get into all of that. Now, the book um, opens with a long free verse poem I wrote. I was, tears were flowing down my face as I wrote this poem in November 2014. It was, you know, about an Alexei imagining, like, if he had not passed away so young, been murdered, obviously, and, you know, if he had been allowed to become a wonderful good czar, just imagining all these wonderful things that never happened, but that they should have happened if, you know, history had been, you know, correct and he had been given a chance to live and prove himself. And I also opened it with several um, real quotes from Alexei and also additionally, um, one of the opening quotes of the book is from the last um, intertitles of the 1926 um, German expressionist film Faust, directed by F.W. Murnau, and the quote also appears towards the end of the book too. It's a very um, beautiful, moving quote, which I felt was very appropriate for the book. Um, Mephistopheles is about to claim um, Faust's soul. He believes he has um, won the bet with an angel he made towards the beginning of the movie, but then an angel with a sword and appears, appears and declares, one word destroys thy pact, and Mephistopheles asks, and what word is that? And then the penultimate end of, uh, enter title says, the word that rings joyfully throughout the universe, the word that appeases every pain and grief, the word that expiates all human guilt, the eternal word, dost thou not know it? Mephistopheles demands, tell me the word. And the final intertitle is in like giant letters, the German word, Liebe, love. And that's just such a beautiful um, m m moment in um, film history and just what I felt was appropriate for the book and what Alexei's imagined um, extended life is all about. He's just guided by love. And now I'm going to be um, taking a lot of my own talking points from the story behind the story back matter I did. I also made up a list of my own um, talking points to supplement it in additional ones. Now, as I mentioned, I began writing this um, the day before my 16th birthday in um, December 95, and I continued working on it until the final day of that year. It was um, all handwritten. And I um, was sharing it. Well, I would, actually wasn't technically like, handwritten for the fullness because I would, you know, like type it up on my computers at school and print them out from there and share it with Creative Writing Club. But the, like, master play which was all handwritten and it was um called the day the children died and it was built around the premise of three children who were murdered at 13 coming back as ghosts for one night to tell their stories hang out with me and another person from the past and revisit scenes from their past two of the girls the children were girls who were killed in the shoah and the other one was alexei called alexis back then i followed the now archaic Anglocentric custom of translating most Russian names because when you know that's the style you see in most books that's what you'll just innocently copy which is why it's like I always talk about this a lot on my main blog it's very important to be accurate as much as possible when you're writing characters from another language and culture you can't just assume oh they must have the same names we do or it's totally cool if we translate their names or like assuming a nickname is like someone's full name, things like that. You just have to be, you know, as correct and accurate as possible when you're writing a foreign culture. You can't just assume things because that really gets you into trouble. And now, um, the play was absolutely terrible, but because Alexei emerged as having the strongest voice, and because I felt a super rational soul connection to him, since learning about his story at age 15, I got the inspiration to write an, alterna an entire alternative history where he was rescued and became the greatest czar in history. But my original discontinued first draft of the story was just as bad. 
For my final project of Creative Writing Club my sophomore year of high school, I wrote a short novella-length story intended to be turned into a full-length novel. It was in diary form, told by a young woman from Yekaterinburg, who um, ended up, it's revealed at the end of this uh, long excerpt, she has the actual name I do, like my real name, my full, my first name is Anna, and uh, my um, patronymic in Russian is Pavlovna, Pavlovna, um, daughter of Paul Pavel, and I'm not going to reveal my um, real surname here, but she did have my um, surname with the um, Russian spelling of it, and um, it was, um, I was intending to write a complete part one narrated by this diarist and add four more parts narrated by young women in succeeding generations, continuing until around, I think, the year 2000. I slightly fleshed out and revised this for a final project in my Russian culture class my senior year of university, and I, th I think I got a fairly good grade on it. I enjoyed that class very much. As I was preparing to finally go back to this story in 2014, after having dreams about Alexei and feeling an overpowering pull to take his story out of hiatus and give him a happy ending already, I quickly realized that format was all wet. It was a well-meaning idea, but far too gimmicky, and took the focus away from the actual protagonist. There always had to be a reason the narrator knew about these events or was able to interact with the Imperial family, even when it defied plausibility or came across as even more gimmicky. Now, this is also reason why you really have to choose your um, point of view and main character um, really carefully. I mean, it, it's not necessarily a badly done gimmick for someone who's not the main character to be a first-person narrator, like, for example, Sherlock Holmes, or like a story that's narrated by um, a stalker about his intended victim, or a story about a queen or a king by the um, chambermaid or another servant, something like that. But you really have to like nail the reason you're doing this and not just do it because, oh, this sounds like a cool thing to do. You have to be more than a gimmick, just choose it because it naturally works with the story and the character, not just, you know, just having fun or trying something different for its own sake. The original hot mess had everyone getting rescued and Nicholas transmogrifying into the strong rule he should have been from the jump. Not only that, all the factors leading to his overthrow and both revolutions are never acknowledged. It's just as though they happened in a vacuum and everyone was eager to give him a second chance and lovingly declare how perfect he was, which obviously was completely ahistorical and total bogus. Like Mikhail, the um, Alexei's uncle, Grand Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich, in the new and improved story, he had an extreme overreaction to the fact that many Bolsheviks had Jewish origins and instituted a nonstop pogrom after being recoronated. There was some silliness about Boris Leonidovich Pasternak's family being hidden in a palace because he was such a great poet, too great a cultural treasure to be lost. At Alexei's coronation, which happened immediately after his father's death in 1929, Boris Leonidovich read some of his poetry. He also appeared at several other points to read poetry. Owing to the fact that I was an Anastasian for almost 20 years, which is greatly embarrassing to me to admit now, there were several things in that book based on the false information and conspiracy theories put forth by that crowd. I accepted them unquestioningly and thus incorporated them as matter-of-fact truths. Although at least in 1996 and even 2001, it was possible to accept said misinformation based on a lack of strong, widely available evidence to the contrary. And uh, um, if you don't know, you probably might have guessed by the word an Anastasian believes um, Anna Anderson was the Grand Duchess Anastasia and that like the Grand Duchess was really never murdered. Now, unfortunately, we do know she was, you know, tragically murdered with all the rest of her family and therefore um, final servants. I found this out during, um, when I was reading The Resurrection of the Romanovs, that, like, totally blows away any last cl claim or, like, view you might have that, oh, maybe she really was, and, like, the DNA was, you know, there was some monkey business with it. No, it's not just DNA. It's, like, multiple, like, documentary evidence from multiple countries over many decades, and there's also, like, multiple DNA tests from multiple labs in multiple countries over many years, too. It's just, like, not just saying, oh, someone fiddled around with the DNA because of a conspiracy theory, or she just happened to know all the stuff and, like, she lost some memory or was, like, disfigured by, like, being severely beaten in that cellar. No, you can't just dismiss all this evidence when it's just staring you in the face. So, unfortunately, Anastasia was, you know, murdered with the rest of her family at the age of barely 17 years old, and anyone claiming to be her was um, a huge fraud. Although I do believe possibly after like about 60 years in this charade, it is possible Franziska Shanskowska maybe possibly really did believe she was Anastasia by the end of her life, but really that's as far as it goes, she was a fraud. And just as in the rewrite, the unlikely Tsaritsa, the empress wife of the Tsar, was from Yekaterinburg. 
she was good friends with the narrator of part one and a total commoner. And the rewrite the new Tsaritsa is um, a morganatic princess, meaning her um, father is a prince, but her mother was a commoner. And Cossacks rode into town to kidnap a bride from among the city's single ladies because Alexei had refused to marry and have children for the same reasons as in the rewrite. He's um, very scared of passing on his disease to children and leaving a very young widow. They randomly selected 23-year-old Varvara Yuryevna Pafnova, went by Varya, who was hiding in her house and horrified to marry someone the entire empire thought was a madman because of his liberal reforms, odd behavior, reversal of the nonstop pogrom, rehabilitation of several prominent Bolsheviks whom he invited into his government, and refusal to marry. And the storyline with Varya was just such stupid soap opera-esque garbage. She was constantly running away, and both she and her unwanted husband slept in different beds until Cossacks and Empress Alexandra forced them to share a room. An annulment was planned, but at the ball to formally announce it, they realized they were in love and couldn't go through with it. Nine months later, their first child, Stepan, was born. Just like That storyline just totally makes me cringe as an adult. I kept Varvara as the unlikely Zaritsa's baptismal name, but no longer liked the name enough to use it for a main character. It's just, you know, so old-fashioned and heavy, kind of like the English name Barbara. I mean, obviously no offense to anyone watching this or someone who knows someone named Barbara. I know it's obviously many wonderful Barbara's throughout history, but, you know, the name itself is just kind of, you know, dated right now. It no longer evokes the same sense of, you know, like being a, like, young, glamorous, sophisticated woman it might have done, like, in the 30s. 40s and 50s. The um, new um, Zaritsa's name is Arkadia. I'll explain the um, inspiration for that a bit later in this. And the, um, the I also changed the name of the oldest child Alexei had. It was originally um, Stepan, but I changed it to Yaroslav, um, Yarek for short, after I'm a past um, Grand Prince of Kiev, um, Yaroslav the Wise, who is also actually one of my um, very um, far um, ancestors. I have a lot of really interesting ancestry in my um, family tree. And the oldest daughter was originally named Daria, but by since then I had uh, another Daria in my um, Russian um, novels with other characters. I just couldn't picture any other character having that name, and I changed it to Dina, but because I wrote this book wildly out of order, I uh, along the way I forgot Dina was supposed to be the older daughter, and I just wrote her as the baby sister. And by the time I realized my mistake, it was just too late to change my mental image of her. And the narrator of Part two, as I originally planned with a diary format, was a Jewish-Hungarian girl named Mansi Katz who lived in Gyur and was, with her family, evacuated to Russia via Finland after the Nazi occupation of their country. I kept this character, though she didn't end up as prominent as I envisioned her. My original plan to, happen, to have the Shoah happen on a far, far, far less tragic scale was retained, and that's like the main um, plot of Part Four, and as was Mansi's letter being the impetus for um, Alexei deciding to rescue the entire Hungarian Jewish community. And um, in part four of the total rewrite, which ended up in the published book, there's also a lot more, you know, intense drama involving this rescue. He makes a deal with the devil who's Eichmann, and um, he sends some of his cousins to Budapest uh, to, like, deliver a giant bribe, which is intended to be, like, taken back to the Russian Empire as soon as they get the entire Jewish population on sealed trains brought to safety. But there's, you know, a little bit of a hitch. Eichmann takes, end up taking the prince's hostage until, like, the deal fully goes through. And there's, you know, a lot of tense drama to, you know, get the princes back to safety and, like, take care of these, like, evil people, you know, holding them hostage. It's much different than it happened in real history, obviously. And the second attempt at writing this book in 2001 introduced the semi-epistolary format I frequently used in the rewrite, like with like frequent newspaper stories saying things that are going on outside of what like the main um, narrative characters would know about. And these newspaper stories included like a Stalin's mass grave of priests that was discovered after the um, royal fa imperial family was restored to the throne and the darkly comedic prisoner was between Lenin and Stalin. It started, they were started as um, clippings inserted by the narrator to convey information she wouldn't have witnessed herself. And I just liked that idea so much. I continued it in the um, complete rewrite many years later because it just felt like a really good way to insert like outside information without coming across as like, you know, stilted or gimmicky. The original material is just like so detached from actual history and real Russian culture, like trains traveled way too fast and along bizarre routes. The narrator's commoner family attended the coronation, which obviously that never happened. Commoners didn't get anywhere near there. The new Tsaritsa was a commoner instead of a princess of any sort, just 
randomly chosen by Cossacks and accepted by Dowager Empress Alexandra. Like we all know if you're like living in reality, she probably would not have happily accepted even like a full like royal princess of the blood for her like precious little baby boy. Alexei was coronated days after his father's death in St. Petersburg when coronations were done in Moskva, Moscow, that, you know, I just didn't know, like, anything about this. Like, characters and plot development were paper-thin to non-existent, and the story just rushed along. Things just happened without any apparent motivation or gradual development. No character ever came alive as more than a name on a page, like, reciting dialogue and doing things. The narrator also had no personality, and she was like just a diarist, blandly reporting events, like acting as a silly cipher, mindlessly parroting catchphrases, doing nothing but recording unfolding history in this stupid, short-lived soap opera, Re Alexei and Varya. And her name also wasn't given until she signed off on the final entry in 1933 on the eve of her marriage. And as I mentioned, she had, you know, the version of my name in Russian, which is like kind of like stupid, I realize now. And it was like so obvious I had to recast the story in my usual third person omniscient, albeit much closer to third person limited than I usually do. So that way the focus stayed squarely where it belonged, not thousands of kilometers away and alternating awkwardly conveying important plot details and narrating events that had nothing to do with the real protagonist. It's also obviously I had to keep Alexei's parents murdered as awful as that sounds. Like, does anyone really believe they would have radically changed if they were rescued and restored to power? Like, keeping them murdered also forces their daughters to finally have adult independent lives and saves Arcadia, the empress, from having to compete with her overbearing mother-in-law to be the number one woman in Alexei's heart. None of the extended um, family members were in the original, which also profoundly disconnected it from its purported setting. Like, I mean, I genuinely didn't know anything about any of the extended branches of the Romanov family at when I originally was writing it at um, 15, 16, and then again later at 21, 22. I mean, I just genuinely had never, like, thought to really look into this or didn't think it, I should have put them in the book for whatever reasons. And the plot was really enhanced by having, like, certain people, like, live longer than they did in real life, like um, the Dowager Empress and Maria Fyodorovna, um, Alexei's grandmother, and um, Michan, Michan um, the Grand Duchess, um, Maria Pavlova, the elder. She was um, the married to Grand Duke Vladimir Alexandrovich, who is um, the oldest son of one or one of the sons of Alexander the Second, and like she was like really sore. Her family didn't get to like be on the throne and you know there was lots of you know drama between those branches of the Romanov family for years like conspiracies to try to get themselves on the throne like very you know ambitious machinations behind the scenes and it was just really so fun to include her particularly making her into a main character in part four she was just like so fun to write her scenes all practically wrote themselves and the last mistress of the robes was also kept alive a few years longer because I just didn't want to avoid figuring out whom her replacement would have been. I really didn't have like easy access to all these like lists of like, you know, servants and how long they had stayed and like people, members of the court, things like that. The, and the later mistress of the robes who, who appears at um, a baptism for Alexei and Arkadia's um, final youngest child was an educated guest. So she was a real person too. And so in short, it was like little more than a well-meaning fantasy. And because of the misplaced narrative structure, there was no real chance for proper character or plot development, and there was so there was never any sense of just why Alexei becomes such a radical reformer and sympathetic to the Jewish plight, because we obviously know that unfortunately, like, all the previous um, rulers of Russia were extremely anti-Semitic, that's why so many of us um, immigrated, like, out of Russia and um, came to the U.S. because of all these, like, pogroms, like, forced um, conscription into the military for young boys, like, institutionalized systemic anti-Semitism and, you know, all sorts of, like, horrible things going on. And um, his fear of having sick children and leaving a young widow, which did make sense, just also wasn't explored properly. It was just, like, dumped on the page and supposed to be accepted. I realized it made far more sense for him to seek, like, a native-born Russian wife from a non-reigning house or a morganatic princess after he's finally forced to take a wife. The common people wouldn't have wanted yet another foreign princess, let alone a German, so soon after World War I. Making Arkadia seven years older instead of keeping her two years younger was also just what Alexei needs, because, you know, many younger men are, you know, whipped into shape and forced to, like, mature a little bit by, you know, the wisdom and experience of having a slightly older woman. And I myself, um, like younger men, obviously not like super, super, super young. I think the youngest I would realistically go at my age 41 would be about 
25 years old, but you know, I do far prefer um, younger men to men around my age or older, so I know that makes me a bit unusual, but I know I'm different from other people anyway. And um, it also makes the fairy tale, the fantasy like fairy tale Arcadia steps into even more unconventional and distinctive and underlies what an unusual sovereign Alexei is, unafraid to be different from the others. On a personal level, I felt like it was the right decision to step back from the story for so many years and only go back in 2014, largely from scratch and memory, not just because I finally by then had a much more extensive grounding in Russian history and culture, but also because I finally knew what it was like to look death in the face and win, as Alexei did so many times in his too short life. I was, um, as I've mentioned in several previous vlogs, run over by a car and pinned underneath in August 2003 and unable to walk for 11 months. Without that intimate understanding of what it's like to think you're about to die, and the crushing powerlessness and torture of being immobile for so long, I wouldn't have been able to bring such feelings alive in the most accurate way. Even at um, 15, when I was drawing that terrible unfinished play, when my writing style and grounding in Russian history and culture still left quite a lot to be desired, I was driven by the same thing that drove me to revisit this story in my 30s. I had to give that beautiful, innocent boy the happy ending he was robbed of in real life, and to define him not by his disease, position as heir, and life of suffering, but someone who truly had the potential to become a great czar, bring Russia into the modern era, and help all those in need. And I'm going to like explain a bit about the things in my um talking point. Um, the name Arcadia, as I mentioned, it wasn't like originally planned. Her name was originally Baria, and Arcadia is kind of like an unusual Russian name. The male um version Arkady is like relatively common, but you know you don't really hear many um women named Arcadia, and it was because um you know the she she explains her parents named her that because of like the Arcadian um. Utopia Arcadia would be obviously the English pronunciation in, you know, ancient Greece. And as if you've been um, reading my um, blog for a long time, you know I've been a Durani, uh, Duran Duran fan for about um, ten and a half years now. My um, Duran anniversary, the day I officially like feel like I became like a, an official fan, is on um, Valentine's Day. That happened in 2011. Anyway, there were was um, a side project spinoff in the 80s called um, Arcad Arcadia, and so I really liked that idea and used that for the reason behind her name. And if you're wondering, my favorite um, songs by them are um, The Seventh Stranger and Secret October. And also, um, for a long time when I was doing the um, going back from scratch and memory in 2014 and like on and on for like when I continued writing it through um, 2018 when it was published, I really couldn't figure out what to do with Anastasia at first. And I kind of think like subconsciously that was like an over reaction because she's just way so overused and like all these like books and films like if you would like talk to these like people who don't know anything about the last imperial family they would think she was like the most famous and popular of Nicholas II's daughters or children overall and that's actually not true at all in her own lifetime she was the least known and like the least popular expected to like make the least you know not successful but just you know to like a lesser ranking prince than the oldest because she was like the youngest child actually in their lifetimes the most um popular and famous of the girls was tatiana she was considered to be the, the, the most beautiful and she was also very like known and respected because of her nursing work so you know if history had you know proceeded like differently they hadn't been murdered if they'd been restored to the throne anastasia probably would not have been very you know well known at all just like history had been like predicting for her and you know like and I've also like mentioned, you know, many people don't know anything about the extended imperial family beyond like Nicholas II and his family. They don't know about earlier Romanovs or any Yurikoviches or like any of things like that. And so I felt that was like, you know, a good chance to put some like more history into this and not just be like another like, you know, fanning, like swooning, squeeing over like the last Romanovs and like old romantic nostalgia about them because, you know, some people like I mean it's they need to be honest with themselves and just say oh I like Nicholas the second and his family like and but they actually like you know pretend oh I love the Romanovs and the Russian imperial family in general no you don't you just like Nicholas the second like own up to that and you know, just move on don't pretend you like all of them and I um, wrote this um, book uh, wildly out of order when I went back because I there was like an over powering sadness I had because I knew like in real life they had been you know murdered at this time when they're you know talking about oh it's so wonderful we're rescued and going back to you know start their lives over and I just so felt like emotionally distant from them I just couldn't like really get close to them and also it was like really awkward for me to like write about 
real people. Obviously, I'm not never really wrote like any fan fiction. It just like feels like kind of stilted and awkward and weird for me to like write about real people instead of completely fictional characters for many reasons. And so I completely like acknowledge this is probably like a fault of this book. I was too like distant even for my usual like old fashioned third person omniscient style. It was like even more like distant than my usual that I have since like developed and grown into. And so I know it might, some people might see that like as a flaw of the book. And I realize if I were writing it just now from scratch, I would write a lot of things m many much differently. Like for example, I would flesh out each of the succeeding parts leading up to part four instead of like having them get in successively longer and longer possibly even like put them out each as four um separate books or maybe just you know do lo each make each one longer but the book obviously would have been a lot you know much higher word count if I had done that so probably it did you know ultimately come together the way it was like supposed to be but, you know, I do really do feel that it was this way for a reason. And I probably will not go back and flesh out parts one, two, and three and put them out as separate volumes because, you know, we need just to move on to new projects and realize we can do those differently with the knowledge we've learned from it. And obviously, as you see, the trim size is a bit um, different. If you notice, this is um, 7 by 10. That's because um, the book, the word count, not counting front and back matter, is about... 405,000 words, which is um, extremely long, even for my um, super doorstopper standards. I didn't expect it to be quite that long. And if I had kept it in like a six by um, nine trim size, which is the normal trim size for like adult novels, it would have been like over a thousand pages, which, you know, I think it's a little bit above what Ingram Spark accepts. That's the indie um, publication company I'm going with for my um, print and hardcover editions and you know also you know the margin size also matters in a, a book when you're doing like a long book and you have to make sure they're not like too like tight and also not too wide and like the longer it gets like the harder it can be to read so that's why I do prefer like bigger trim sizes for like super long books it's extremely hard to, to read um trim small trim sizes for books like that are like over a thousand pages like for example like Gone with the Wind or Forever Amber they just realistically don't work in like a, like a four by eight or whatever the four by five whatever you know the trim must market paperback sizes are it can be like okay to read for like a class or when you're a teenager in your 20s or have like better eyes but you just generally don't like read them that well I'm sorry I'm rambling and you know I'm, I'm going uh, there were uh, I did write uh, the real people in the story appendix like and some of the um my favorite real people in the story besides obviously Alexei and his um sisters were um Zabaris the third of Bulgaria whose um life I also extended he um helped to save his um country's entire Jewish community from being deported to his um great eternal credit some people believe I also share this theory that he was um, actually um, murdered by Hitler at their final meeting because he was like so angry. Boris kept refusing to deport his country's Jewish community or even like, you know, put them to work for anything besides like building railroads. And also I liked um, Queen Mother Elena of Romania, who was um, posthumously honored by Yad Vashem as one of the righteous among the nations. She did a lot to help save them, the Jewish community of Romania during the war, and also influenced her son, Michael Mihai, to, um, you know, find some guts and, like, overthrow the fascist Iron Guard in charge of Romania and um, switch to the Allies, which probably shortened the cost, the length of World War II by at least six months. They also loved um, the husbands for um, Grand Duchess Maria and um, Olga, respectively, um, Igar and um, Konstantin Konstantinovich, they were um, princes, um, second cousins. They were very um, interesting um, people. And for um, Grand Duchess Tatyana, her husband is um, Prince um, Vladimir Pavlovich Paley. He was actually Romanov, because, but because he was Morganatic, he was unable to use his um, legally correct um, surname. And um, Anastasia's husband, Prince, Prince Roman Petrovich, who did um, survive in real life. He wasn't murdered. Um, Princess Ileana of Romania and um, Princess um, Ingrid of Sweden, who later became um, Queen Ingrid of Sweden. Both of them were probably wonderful um, candidates for Alexei to have married if the um, monarchy had um, continued in real life. But, you know, I avoided that because I just wanted him to, like, you know, make a clean 
break and marry someone of his own choosing, someone who w hadn't been married in and out of the family over and over again. And also it's just like way too expected. Too many people doing what if stories like marry him off to Ileana, like they don't even consider any other princesses. Like it's just a done deal. And I like avoiding cliches and tropes as much as possible. I also enjoyed at one point, I'm writing a letter from um, Princess Ileana's mother, Queen Marie of Romania to Alexei. It was really fun to write as her for a little bit. She's one of my absolute favorite queens. And I loved um, the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna, Alexei's grandmother. She was like really like fun to write. And also, as I mentioned, um, Nietzschean, um, Grand Duchess Maria Pavlova, the elder. She was just, you know, such a, like a fun character. And King um, Michael Mihai of Romania, he was also fun. And um, Alexei's uncle, Grand um, Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich, who becomes his guardian. Like all these like people were just like really fun for me to write. And there was um, Bimbo, his um, real name was um, Grand Duke Mikhail Nikolaevich. His um, family were, was um, raised in um, Georgia instead of St. Petersburg. And as a result, uh, everyone in his family was notoriously more like reform and liberal minded than like the Romanovs who were like just sitting in like in, in um, St. Petersburg and like the same old same old over and over again not being exposed to any sorts of different ideas He was also like a an avid um, reader um writer historian and scientist and a very very interesting person he becomes Alexei's um right-hand man in the government despite his um age and also that liked um Alexander Pachersky who was um he helped to um lead the revolt at Sobibor and he like serves like a, a heroic role in the book two, like serving in the, the partisans and then serving in the official um, military unit with like the Russian Imperial Army. And he does like a wonderful mission. I won't spoil it, obviously, but like he serves in an extremely like heroic mission, like at the end of the war, like anybody would be proud of what the outcome of that mission was. And I also wrote several other um, appendices besides um, the real people in the story, like realistically managing hemophilia. And, you know, wrestling with the house laws. Obviously, this vlog is getting far longer than I expected it to be. But um, those, um, if you buy the book, which I hope you do, I would, like, appreciate more, like, readers and um, reviewers. It, you know, explores how, like, to realistically manage hemophilia and make sure um, Alexei, you know, would have, like, survived. Obviously, not pretending he suddenly became completely well or that the disease was, like, not as big as it used to be. But just, you know, keeping in mind a lot of things and so, you know, he could, like, survive while still... Still, like dealing with the disease and that obviously there will eventually be um good breakthroughs and with the house laws appendix I like talked about you know we they probably would have reformed the house laws in real life anyway and as existing they were like way too draconian and like so many people are like completely unrealistically bound to these house laws when they create their own like what if stories like you know come on these house laws were totally realistic and out of touch with you know modern realities and also they could not have continued even if like the monarchy had you know s continued at the same pace you eventually will run out of people like who are like fully like equally ranked um royals who aren't related to you like multiple times over and who are like orthodox or willing to convert to orthodoxy within like 10 or so years of your age so you know there's lots of things to think about when you get into things like this and obviously then I included a, a glossary at the end with all the um like foreign words and foods and like references and stuff I had mentioned I'm sorry this vlog ran much longer than I expected to I would like really appreciate if you would um buy this book I worked um very hard on it at least um on July 17th 2018 which was the 100th anniversary of the murder of the Romanovs the um last imperial family Nicholas II and his family and I it's one of the books that's um closest to my heart because it's about a real person I felt like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have been able to forgive myself if I'd gone to my grave never having continued um, with this project. And I know, you know, it is like a larger trim size, but it does still fit comfortably on a bookshelf. And I didn't feel like this trim size was the right decision because of like the length of the book. And so I'm hopefully if you've continued watching to the end, um, congratulations for reaching the end. I really appreciate it. I'll see you again. Possibly I'm talking about something on Monday. I'm much shorter and length and I'll talk to you again maybe on Wednesday and on Sunday. So thank you very much for listening and please consider subscribing. Thanks. Bye.